Hi, I'm Chris Kanish and this is CS361, Systems Programming. Today, we're going to be talking about how the operating system keeps track of files for us in Unix-derived Linux operating systems. Let's get started. So, uh, jumping right in here, the previous video, we talked about how we, as the user-level programmers, are going to use the operating system to read and write and seek and open and close and all that good stuff. And the key component to that was the file descriptor. This is just an integer value that you're given as a user level process that is kind of a ticket that you can hand to the operating system and say, hey, I want you to read from this file. I want you to seek in this file. I want you to write to this file. I want you to close this file. That is just an integer. And there is a table that keeps track of all of these integers for your process, for, for every single process that's running. Right, if we go back to our examples over here, we look at our U limits, we can have up to 1 million, uh, base two, I guess, uh, files open at any given point in time in a user level program on my Docker container machine here. So, I, so there is a table with 1 million entries, that, you know, most of them are probably not allocated, uh, but there are 1 million different entries that I could potentially have for different files opened by my process. That's just how big that uh, table is. And it's indexed by those file descriptors. So there's going to be an array of data structures that say here is what's connected to file descriptor 0. Here's what's connected to file descriptor 1. Here's what's connected to file descriptor 2. Those are the user-facing pieces of information. That's the first thing that the operating system is going to look through when it is servicing a read or a write system call. It's going to look through that descriptor table for your process and say, this links to a element of the open file table. So when we're working with the open file table, this is not kept on a per process basis. This is a global table that all processes kind of share when it comes to which files they have open. So every call to open, and this is gonna be mind blowing, creates an entry in the open file table. When you open a file, it is going to be opened to a specific file position. And it's also gonna very interestingly have a reference count, which basically says how many different file descriptors are currently pointing at this open file table entry. And this keeps track of the state of one read through a, uh, one travel, one path, one use of a file, right? So the operating system is gonna be keeping track of where I am in that file, what modes it has it open with, which file is actually the underlying file, and how many different processes have access to this open file table entry. Uh, and, there's, and every time somebody uses it, it's going to update the file position. Right? There, there's always going to be some location within this file that I'm currently reading from or writing to. And every time I return a return value to read and it returns back 20 bytes, I'm gonna increment file pose by 20. If I seek to the beginning of the file, I'm gonna set file pose to zero. Uh, and we'll see a little bit later on in this lecture uh, what happens with this reference count. It gets a little tricky, but we'll get there. The next component here is the vnode table. So this is very similar, so this is another global data structure that is shared by all of the processes on the machine. And it's very similar to actually the files on the disk. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's like an operating system level abstraction of any way to store files on a disk in the computer, right? So you could have virtual files that are connected to terminals, you could have files that are connected to a networked file system that's actually keeping the file on several different machines within my network. There's lots of different ways that I could keep the actual files stored on spinning disks or SSDs or RAM disks or whatever. But the vnode table says, listen, I don't care how it gets stored, but here is an abstraction that talks about the file which exists someplace. And there's one vnode table entry for each file, we can think of it the way that we're talking about it right now, that has to do with how big the file is, what type of file it is, what permissions it has, where on the actual disk is this file stored, where within the file system is this file stored. This is one entry 
per file. Our open file table is one entry per open. Our file descriptor table is one entry per file which is visible to a given running process. And each of those is visible through that ticketing system, the file descriptions, which are just integers. So uh, one way that we can open two different files is just like we see on the screen here. If I open a, a third file and I open a fourth file, or like file descriptor three, I open file descriptor four, usually you know, in almost all situations before we start messing around with the file descriptors, every time we run open, we get a new file, open file table entry. Every open file table entry points back at a different vnode table entry if they are two different files which were opened. You could imagine that if I open the same file in two different file descriptors, I can be reading from it at different places. Like I can read from the very beginning and I can write to the very end at the same time if I wanted to and I can open that up if I didn't want to keep seeking back and forth and back and forth in two different file, in one different, if I didn't want to keep seeking back and forth in one file descriptor, I could simply open it twice and I have two file descriptors, one that I use to just read from the beginning, one that I use to write to the end, and you know, I could do whatever it is I wanted to do. That doesn't, can't immediately off the top of my head think of some way to use that, but you can. Uh, and they both point back to the same V node table entry because they are the same file which is open, but they're open with different modes, with uh, at different positions, shared by a different number of uh, subprocesses, et cetera, stuff like that. Now, uh, I don't know. Yeah, so we can read from different file locations. The, the tricky part here with open file table entries is that if I open a file, then I fork the process, there are, there are two references to that open file table entry. We talked a little bit about this, I think in class last Thursday, where if I have one file open, and I fork it, the process and I read from the parent, the child is gonna read the next 20 bytes. Now, that is because when you uh, have a certain number of files open and you fork that into a new process, both the original process, both the parent process and the child process are going to have their own file descriptor tables because they're different processes, but they point at the same open file table entry. So if I read in the parent, if I read the first 100 bytes in the parent, the next 100 bytes are the ones that are available to the child. If I read those 100 bytes in the child, even though the parent left, the parent read zero through 99, the child reads 100 through 199, the next read that happens in the parent will not read these next 100. It will read the next 100 after that. It'll read you know, 201 to 299, whatever have you. That is the tricky part about forking is that you are sharing that open file table entry after the fork. Important information that's what we want to keep track of here. Now, it gets even more complicated uh, in a way that we're going to need to manipulate in order to run our shell. Now, if uh, we can do a really quick user level uh, explanation, user level demo of how piping works, that's one of the things that you need to do in homework three. So if I do an ls, let's just do u limit dash a. If I wanted to say how many lines are in this file, I can pipe that output to the standard input of the wc program. And the wc program will count the number of lines, the number of words, and the number of characters in the file that I sent to it. When we have a shell and it gets an input like this u limit, dash a pipe to wc. ulimit dash a is a program that has a standard in and a standard out. There's a standard error, but we don't care about that for right now. We're not worrying about that. One. wc is a program that has a standard in and a standard out. So if I run ulimit dash a, I get this output. If I run ulimit dash a, and I pipe it to WC, I get this output. If I run WC by itself, I'm not connecting its standard into anything besides the terminal. So here I can pipe 
I can hit enter and I can say this is another sentence. Yada yada. I hit control D. Control D, remember from the last lecture, sends end of file. That is a special command. This is a special, it's called a meta character that the shell receives from my keyboard saying, aha, they don't actually want to insert the caret and the D or some, whatever, some special thing. They want to indicate that there is no more input coming from this file. The file that WC is reading from standard in has finished. There's nothing that will ever come up out of it again. It is done. And when WC sees, oh, I have received the end of my input, then it knows that it's done and it can print to the screen what it is supposed to print. The number of lines, the number of words, and the number of characters. So what I end up with here is if I want to do this, what I'm doing is I'm saying take the output from that first program and send it through as input to the next program. Just like uh, standard in can have an end of file, when I run ulimit that a, I receive an end of file read from that program that is, is sending stuff to standard out. And that program then exits. And that program returns control to my shell. So if I go back over to my drawing, what I want to do, remember, is so I'm gonna have the zero and the one and the zero and the one. What I wanna have happen is I want to take everything that gets written to this standard out and I want to connect it to the standard in of WC. Now by default, if I just exec v this process with nothing else happening, what would functionally happen is that the new version of the process is just going to inherit the open file descriptors of the parent. The parent bash in this case is connected to my terminal and my keyboard. And so when that program runs with no input or output redirection, it's gonna read its input from my terminal, from my keyboard, and it's gonna write its output to my terminal, to, to my screen. I can change those both with input and output redirection. So back over here. So with input or with output redirection, I can change that to send to a file or read from a file. So if I do a ulimit dash a, ulimit dash result, then I have a file in this directory called ulimit dash result. Come on, there we go. So that file is just the output of the result of running ulimit. If I want to redirect the input from a file, I can do wc and redirect the input from ulimit dot result. That's gonna give me that same output. So that does the same thing. You can see here that we're already seeing some weird differences. This type of thing happens a lot and it really sucks for us when we write auto graders. But one very confusing quality of life thing is that when a program like LS or in this case WC opens a file, it can know it's talking to a terminal or it's talking to a file system file. And these programs are super, super useful. And they're like, oh, well, I'm gonna do different things based on whether I'm printing to the screen or printing to a file. So if I do ls, I get all these files listed out, you know, list of files, space, space, list of files, space, space, list of files, space, space. Now if I do ls, and I type that into ls output, and I come over here and I open it, it gives it to me one per line. So that's different than this. That's because ls knew that I was using a file as its output rather than a terminal as its output. And it decided, oh, well, if this person wants to send it to a file, I should probably give it to him one per line rather than giving it to him in a human readable form. So this is kind of like the machine readable form if it knows it's not sending it to the screen. If you want to just simulate it sending to a file, you can do ls to cat like that. And that will fake it into believing that it is sending those bytes to a file when it's actually just sending it to a file, which is being piped to a program, which is cat. It's not sending it to a terminal. That's all it really cares about. So ulimit dash a has a standard out, wc has a standard in. What we want to happen is 
I want this file descriptor, well, I want writes that go into this file descriptor one to show up as reads that show up on file descriptor zero in WC. What I need to do to do that is one, create a pipe, and a pipe is a special thing which has two file descriptors associated with it, one that's the input of the pipe and one that's the output of the pipe. I can just create that and anything written to one of them is read out of the other side. I think if I come back over to my primary screen and I do a man pipe, this will create that pipe for me. So this is an int array. So this is an, a pointer to an array of two integers. And so it will be populated with the file descriptors for these two new uh, pipes, the, the sending end and the receiving end. So we also have, you know, we can open it with some flags, uh, which aren't gonna be super important. But the basic idea here is that once we have created this pipe that has an input and an output, then we can fork our two different processes, or, or in our case for our assignment, we can POSIX spawn these two different subprocesses, and we can tell the uLimit subprocess, hey, you, rather than writing to standard out, I want you to write to the input half of this pipe. And then I'm going to spawn this WC and what I'm gonna say to WC is, hey, rather than writing, reading from standard in, I want you to read from the second element of that file descriptor array. And what we've effectively done is, you know, we just hooked up a literal pipe up to the output of one into the input of another, just like we were a good old plumber. Uh, and that will give us this ability to chain these commands to each other the way that we're doing at the shell here. This is all relevant to today's lecture, A, because I want you to you know, be able to get the homework assignment done, but B, because it has a lot to do with this dupe2 system call. So what dupe2 will do for us is exactly what I was talking about here when I said create the pipe and then to connect it to standard in and out in the proper sub processes, right? So what we're going to do with dupe two is in the WC, we are going to take standard in and set it to instead point to the output of the pipe. And in uLimit, we're gonna take standard out and instead point it to the input of the pipe. So we're going to be over, the, the order of these arguments is super, super hard to remember and I'm pretty sure that I just mixed them up. The basic idea is that we wanna put standard in and standard out in the second uh, argument of dupe two, if we're trying to do input and output redirection. So we're gonna take the file descriptor we wanna keep and we're going to put it into the location that is the second one. And it's very confusing, but we're basically overriding new with old. That's how dupe2 works. What we'll do is shove it over there. That, that will also close the file descriptor. So if we switch back over here, we'll see that uh, when I run ls, or if I run w, ulimit-a to wc, it doesn't send its output to standard out. Right, it does, or it doesn't go to my terminal anymore because uLimit's access to the terminal was taken away. It was replaced with access to this pipe that feeds into the WC program and then does the word counting that it's supposed to out of the output of that other program rather than what I typed at the terminal. So that's all I have for you today. This. Uh, kind of culminates in how we do things for homework three. And we're talking a little bit about the underlying information here about replacing things in these file descriptor tables. What we're basically doing is 
we're keeping our open file table entries, but then changing where they are in the descriptor tables in order to do input and output redirection to create these pipes. When we do pipe, we create two open file table entries, and then we manipulate where they show up in the descriptor tables to actually make the piping work correctly. That's what I've got for you today. Thank you so much, and I will see you next time.